I'll continue. How's everybody's weeks going by so far? Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> the terms are hitting hard, but you know, <laughs> that's the Already? Year. Oh Ooh. yeah, never ends with quarter system, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I used to go through that. Yeah, it gets, it now. <laughs> I, when, once you graduate, and, and Doug, Doug can confirm this, or any of the other people, who have graduated can confirm that when you look back and you remember, man, I want, I remember when my biggest problem was having a final or a midterm. <laughs> Those are some golden memories right there. <laughs> <laughs> All else I've heard we a lot about write. that. I mean, I know there are problems beyond that, but yeah. it's just, it just funny, yeah. interesting to think about. Yeah. I think something that came up earlier today for me was thinking about how last year we got our admissions and it's been already a year since we've been at UCLA and then a year forward, I'm gonna be alumni as well. So that's kind of scary, but exciting to think about. Um, bittersweet, I guess, but it's just like <laughs> being, in that, being in that mindset, you know? I know I, Justin's recently graduated and we're already joking like, how does it feel, Justin, you know? Yeah, I feel old. <laughs> you know, I feel old. I think it feels like it's it's so long when you're preparing to attend uh, school uh, before transferring, but after you transfer, the time goes by like that. Really quickly, right? Right. Really, really does. Yeah. It's good to put uh, faces to the names that I've seen in the email correspondence. How do you say your name? Your name is it, Janu? It's Janu. Yeah, that was perfect. Oh. <laughs> wow, no what one about ever your last name? read on the first try. That was great. <laughs> Just Justin Justin Tom. Yeah, really hard. <laughs> Kyla Beatriz um, Alberto. Yep, okay. I'm I'm Filipina, so it's the whole first name, two first name basis is how people usually tell. Mm. <laughs> how are you guys doing, uh, Jordan and Avril? Uh, okay day? Yeah, it's great. It's my first day um, since graduating, so I'm enjoying oh, wow. um, not being in class, so I'm having a great time. Congrats. That's thank awesome. you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. It feels really good. And yeah, I'm doing pretty well. I'm actually uh, a visiting family in Miami, so it's, uh, oh, wow. yeah, it's, a little, it's a little later for me than normal, so I'm, uh, if I'm a little droopy, you know why. Are you, in, oh. are you in school? Jordan? I am a joint degree student, so I technically have finished my two years for the MBA, and I've got a, an additional year for a master's in science. Oh, right on, right on. Yeah. Jo Jordan, I heard a rumor in, in our Slack that you guys are graduating in person. <laughs> <laughs> there is a there is okay. a movement to push for it, uh, and it, there's definitely a lot of back and forth right now and a lot of drama, okay, but so there okay. will almost certainly be some, the Stanford as a university is gonna be in person. Uh, oh, okay. The business school is trying to carve out their own, their own in-person weekend, uh, and we'll probably will get something. What, it, what that is is yet to okay. be determined. Yeah, like literally it was posted an hour ago and we were, we're hitting up our Dean, because it's, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're I'm virtual. happy to I'm happy to share more details with you okay, offline, offline if you want to yes. use use uh, us as an example for leverage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's like it's like when you get a you know when you get a salary offer right and it's like oh well, I'm you know I've already got my offer for X so you're gonna have to do better than this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, I think we can get started because um, people have not been joining for the last few minutes, so we can go ahead and start then. Um, so first, right, I'm, I'm gonna just going to ask everyone to, to mute it. yourself for now, if, sure. so we can so everyone can hear the panelists properly. Um, but yeah, so my name is Janu, and I'm a junior board member for Bruin Transfers and Business. Um, for everyone who's new here, thank you for coming. And for everyone who's continued to attend all of our events, we really, really appreciate the support. So today we have some really, really exciting information from our panelists today who we're so thankful to have joined. Um, and also I just wanna encourage everyone, if you haven't already to join our mailing list and to follow our social media on Instagram and Facebook because it is the best way to stay updated on all of our events like this, um, continuing into the following years as well. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have four panelists here today with us, and we're just going to start by letting everyone do a little bit of an intro. And so yeah, if you guys could share your name and also just your education path as far as what schools you attended um, and what year you graduated. So we can just go ahead and start with Robin. Sure. Hi, Robin Barrios, um, UCLA class of 2015. Uh, I studied psychology with an emphasis on social psychology and um, happy to be here. Uh, willing to make this as open as possible. Please, please, please post any questions. This is the time to ask things. Uh, let me know how I can help. All right, thank you. Next we can have Douglas do a little intro. Yeah, so let me start. Um, so I am a proud transfer student. Um, I went to LA Mission College where I got my associates in math. Um, I came obviously here at UCLA. I did math econ class of 14. And now I'm in wrapping up my MBA at Berkeley Haas, which is a school at UC up, up, up north. And I'm graduating in like in two and a half weeks. Nice, congrats, almost done. <laughs> All right, and then next we can have Avril do a little intro. Sure, yeah, thank you so much, I know I appreciate it. Um, hi everybody, I'm Avril Prakash um, for, let's see, um, I'm from uh, San Diego and uh, went to community college um, at a couple of places, but got my associates from San Diego Miramar College, uh, went to UC San Diego where I got my um, uh, bachelor's in political science, thought I was gonna go to uh, law school and thankfully didn't do that, um, and worked in the public sector for a member of Congress and then uh, did government relations for the University of California system as a proud UC alum, and uh, then decided to come to uh, the University of Michigan, um, where I actually got a dual degree. So I have a master's in public policy as well as a master's in business. Um, just graduated on Friday and Saturday and um, have had a whole slew of experiences um, in um, mobility space, in venture capital, and then we'll be uh, joining a venture firm this summer and then we'll be at BCG um, in the fall. So happy to answer any questions about anything. <laughs> so excited to be here. Congrats, that's so awesome, wow. Um, and then lastly, we have Jordan. Hi, I'm uh, Jordan Conger. I actually, there's a surprising amount of overlap with me and Avril, so uh, I will try to keep it somewhat short, but uh, I am also a proud transfer student. I went to not one, not two, but three different community colleges, uh, most all in Oregon, Chemeketa, Portland Community College, and Central Oregon Community College before transferring to Oregon State. I worked more than full time throughout college, so it took me many, many years to finish my undergraduate degree uh, in mathematical economics. I worked for about 10 years in government and politics, mostly running races. Uh, last thing I did before I came to business school is I ran the governor's race up in Oregon. And I am now currently a uh, going into my MBA three year at Stanford, uh, where I have essentially finished my MBA and I'm working on my master's in science in environmental engineering. 
Uh, and this summer and post-graduation, I will most likely go work for BCG in San Francisco on their uh, renewable energy team. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of you guys for joining. Again, we really appreciate it. It's great having all this advice. Um, so how we're kind of going to run this is I'm going to throw some questions out there. Um, feel free to answer it if you feel comfortable. If you don't have anything to add to that particular question, don't have any pressure to answer it. Um, and for our audience, you guys can go ahead and throw questions in the chat at any point, and then we'll address them at the end. Or if you do want to ask them um, like verbally, I can also call on you at the end to do that. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, just feel free to answer this if you're comfortable. So I just wanted to go over um, the kind of transfer connection first. So do schools typically take both of your community college and four-year transcripts, or was it mostly just your four-year transcripts that um, counted? Yeah, go ahead, Douglas. I can start. So when it comes to your, like what the admissions office requires, um, they are going to ask for um, every school that is involved to your degree. They're going to want to know transcripts. And so a lot of MBA students also have masters that I got prior to an MBA. So like they'll ask for all your academic records. Now in terms of what it counts, um, they don't care about your community college GPA, they care about what you get in undergrad. So I wanna emphasize that a lot because um, I thought, oh, okay, my community college GPA was slightly, slightly higher. Can I average it? Can I do that? It's like, nope, they just look at what you got for your undergrad, uh, which is on um, UCLA so for me. Got it, okay, great. Um, if anyone else has anything to add to that, go ahead. Oh yeah, go ahead, Robin. Yeah, um, so just to add a little bit on that, uh, onto that, your, GPA from community college does come in. I think what Doug's trying to say is it gets uh, put together with your undergraduate GPA at UCLA and that's your ultimate GPA. So if you had a 3.5 in community college and then you have a 3.8 at UCLA, then it'll turn you know into something in between. But your GPA from community college does count and it gets counted in the, in the classes that get transferred onto your four year school. Just want to clarify that. Got it. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so this next question, I think everyone might have a little bit of a different answer. Um, so feel free to share. But just wanted to know a little bit about um, your experience as being a transfer. Like, was it kind of looked down upon or was it something that helped you in any way? Um, did you feel like you had to hide that when you were applying? Um, but yeah, just to share about that if possible. Oh, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, so uh, I certainly wouldn't hide it. You, as we've already discussed, you're, you have to put in your transcript for your community colleges. So it's gonna be obvious to them that you are a transfer student. Um, there's a much more, you know, there's a reason why they call it a non-traditional path versus traditional path. I mean, at Stanford, probably, uh, I'd say probably close to 50% of the classes or maybe even 60% has gone to one of the three big management consulting firms. Uh, and or an investment bank or private equity fund. And typically sourced out of like the top 10 um, undergraduates, undergraduate institutions, but uh, they're looking for diversity. And that means not just racially, ethnically, uh, but also ideologically, socioeconomically um, and academically. And so you, it's already there, they're gonna know it. And rather than hide from it, you, what I chose to do was lean into it and and use it as a piece that distinguished me in my class uh, and talked about the different voice and perspective and set of experiences that I had as a transfer student, as somebody who worked full time for you know, eight years um, and went through all these different uh, institutions. I think that's, you know, that, that's gonna be, it can be a distinguishing factor for you or it can work against you. And, and I think the, the answer is to lean into it. Okay, got it. I just have a little follow up question. So when you were um, doing interviews for like jobs or internships, did you tend to include that when you were 
um, being interviewed or did you stay away from that in that case as well? I used, yeah, that's a great question. So I used it for interviews at, at Stanford and at other business schools. I did not use it for job interviews because once I got into Stanford, a lot of these, I found far more prejudice with, um, with, with corporations and with, with those that are looking for jobs uh, because they use it as a heuristic to see if you're credible and they want people who are prestigious. So the, once you get into the business school, just stick to the business school. But when you're actually interviewing for business school, they are looking for some diversity. And so I leveraged that. I said, you know, you're going to get a lot of people who are going to come up here and they're going to tell you about how they did the same four years at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, whatever. Uh, but what they're not going to be able to do is tell you how they worked for eight years you know, how they struggled to make ends meet, how they went through three different community colleges, how I sat next to 55-year-old single mothers who were going back to school, um, you know, and that gives you grit and resilience that, uh, you know, frankly, the others don't have. And, and business schools and academics, they do value that. So there is a distinction between the two. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, that definitely helps. If anyone else has anything to add to that, go on ahead. Yeah, I, I'm happy to uh, jump in there. Um, so I, I think that those are really great points. Um, I think one thing that's really important when you're thinking about applying to business school is thinking about like, what's your story? Um, like, what's your reason for this application and this purpose? And like, what are you hoping to get out of the MBA? And how are you hoping that the MBA will launch you to that thing? And if your community college story uh, feeds into that narrative, then that's really important to highlight and use that as a contribution. If it's something that is, um, uh, you know, when you look back and review it is non-added then it's not necessarily something that uh, you need to highlight, right? Because you really want to focus, um, whether it's in the actual application essay or in the actual um, MBA interview, um, admissions interview, want to be very short and succinct and to uh, uh, getting to uh, communicate why you want to get that MBA or at why that particular program is so important to you. And I think those are really great points about, um, you know, showing how you can differentiate yourself amongst the class, how you're bringing different value as well as like what are the different experiences. Um, I think um, looking back at my community college experience, um, it really showed me a level of like resilience. Um, it also showed me a level of, um, I think, uh, really wanting to understand what I wanted to get out of my education. Um, I think those are experiences that sometimes pe people in other paths might not necessarily have a chance to. They perhaps, you know, just dive into what they think they should be doing. Um, and I found that in my community college experience, I was really able to reflect um, on what I truly wanted to do. It gave me the space and opportunity and the breath um, to pursue those things. So I as a result, I was very um, focused in my graduate school education about what I, how I wanted to kind of build on that. Um, so I I, I would definitely, um, I think, keep it at, like at a high level, really think about like what your story is and how that really adds and builds into that. All right, thank you so much. That's definitely helpful. Um, so next, I just wanna move into a little bit of um, advice as far as undergrad goes. So I just wanted to ask, is there anything that um, any of you wish you did differently during your undergrad as far as maybe an organization you wish you joined or even something specific that you did that you think really helped you. Um, so if you have anything to share regarding that, that'd be great. Go ahead, Robin. Thank you. Uh, yes, I would look into the Reardon programs. Um, UCLA has a really good uh, program um, in the business school that helps people who are interested in pursuing an MBA. Um, I don't know what the applicant uh, pool looks like right now or when the next uh, class is, is expected to begin, but I would look into the scholars program, which helps you get an internship at a, at a corporation and, and it has some eligibility criteria. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I will look into that one or I will look into the UCLA uh, Reardon Fellows program. It's um, an MBA preparation course that gives you more information uh, on how to apply. Uh, there's also a gentleman who comes in um, and does some GMAT prep and gives you a couple of classes for free. So you can get a gauge on what the GMAT is, uh, gives you more information on that. And um, I was part of both programs, so I'm happy to take any questions. Um, is there anything that I would do differently? Um, I guess I didn't understand what networking was. That's uh, a concept that was really foreign to me. Um, I grew up in a Latino background and, um, you know, 
being male, there's this sentiment that I'm not supposed to ask for help in the Guatemalan culture. Um, so I didn't know how to approach that. And I thought that I was, you know, I would be seen as weak if I asked other people for help. And I felt like just networking was like, you know, a, a means to an end. Um, and I didn't like it. So long story short, I started um, just offering help to people and reaching out to people and say, you know, I'm happy to help. This is what I'm good at. Uh, at that time, it was, uh, I was getting started in finance. So people who had questions about, you know, uh, basic uh, personal finance questions, I was helping people. Um, and I got to know people that way. But I, I see it as building community and keeping up with people rather than, you know, I'm, I'm meeting these people so I can get something later on. I just felt disingenuous to me. So I, that's how I went about it. Got it. Thank you. Um, to not think about things like that, but I'm sure that's relatable for a lot of people out there. Um, anyone else have any advice to share? Yeah, I, I can add to that. Um, first off, I want to second what Robin said about uh, actually both things. One, the, I think the work experience is huge. Unlike a lot of other graduate institutions, business school indexes primarily off of what your work experience is and what kind of work perspective you're going to bring and they're looking for people who not only have the breadth and uh, maturity in the workplace that they're going to bring a valuable voice so that their classmates can learn from it but they're also looking for people who are going to be future leaders and that's the best indicator um, and then the second thing on the networking uh, I I grew up in a very poor background and didn't I didn't even know anybody who had an MBA um, let alone one from a, an elite institution and um, the MBA process, the admissions process is very complex, very esoteric, and all the schools are looking for different things. And there's almost a, you know, secret uh, language and nomenclature to it. And so if I could go back and do that differently, I would look at um, finding people from the schools I wanted to go to and really seeing if I could interview them, have them mentor me, have them walk me through the admissions process, review my essays, um, really provide targeted feedback on how to market myself. Um, and the final thing I'll say, one thing that I look back and I think I did well that I would recommend to everybody here as transfer students is there's uh, sometimes there's this intimidation around, well, I didn't go to these fancy schools or didn't go work at Goldman Sachs or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, one thing I've learned since coming to Stanford is that a lot of these schools in Stanford in particular, they look for people who can do extraordinary things even in ordinary circumstances. So what set me apart was not that I, I did all of those things, it's that I was able to be disruptive and to set myself apart within my peer group where I was at and, um, you know, and left my mark. So you know, those people who can kind of show that initiative. Um, so I would look around and do an assessment of where am I at and what opportunities can I do to really set myself apart, whether it's get a research grant, get a fellowship, get a, you know, be mentored by a, a professor, start a nonprofit, start a club, do, you know, take a leadership position, whatever it is, you know, doing those extraordinary things. Um, that's, I think that's what's more important. Awesome, thank you. And a, a quick heads up to all the audience members. I'm not sure if you saw, but there's some resources in the chat. So be sure to save those so that you can refer to them later on as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to move into now is um, just specific tips about your MBA. So this next question is kind of directed at all of you. I'm sure you all have an answer for this, um, but just what made you decide wanting to pursue an MBA if there was anything specific that you're looking for in it? I think I'll start. Um, so, I mean, when I was looking at different graduate programs, actually, when I was a senior at UCLA, I, I did get into UCLA's Master's of Education because I, I really am passionate about education as well. But when I was looking about like uh, in corporate world, like what is one thing that people have or what's one degree that is very malleable? Like I, I still am, I don't know what I do when I want to grow up. and one degree that's always very like has a lot of different um, like uses an MBA and I, and I kept looking at it from different industries okay if I want to pursue this like I thought about doing a, a master's in nonprofit leadership because I came from the nonprofit world but I saw that the MBA was valued more so I, I saw that the MBA is very well respected 
particularly when it comes with um from a well um that's other secret not so secret but in for MBA where, where you get your degree matters so um I was in my head was okay if I could get a degree from this type of institution then um it would be worth pursuing for me awesome thank you um does anyone else want to share about that I'm happy to jump in. Um, so I think similar to uh, Douglas, um, I recognize that uh, an MBA was a huge commitment of like time, um, money, um, and energy. And so as a result, it was really important for me to kind of look at things as, well, what's like my post MBA goals and like what's the best ROI for those. Um, so thinking uh, really intentionally about like where um, I wanted to be. I'd uh, grown up in California, I'd worked um, and gone to school in California. So for me, I really didn't want to go to uh, do my MBA in California. I was really focused on looking at schools outside. Um, and so that kind of really inspired me to be around people who work. Um, I guess, wanting to create their own community. Um, and that's why I really loved uh, Michigan Ross because it's not associated with like a you know big city like Chicago or uh, New York. Um, so people really go, they self-select um, into the Ann Arbor community. And I, I love that. I love the fact that people wanted to like try and um, uh, build some new connections themselves. Um, I'm also like, you'll hear this concept of career switching um, pretty commonly throughout your um, MBA um, uh, admissions or experience. Um, and um, I, like, I always joke um, when talking to a lot of prospective students is like, I'm your tip, like quintessential career switcher. I moved from public sector and I'm going obviously into private sector. And I chose to use my uh, dual degree to not only help me switch um, uh, sectors, but also to switch into different industries. I wanted to move away from education and into mobility. Um, so thinking really concertedly about like, what's the best levers to do that? Um, like I mentioned in my intro, I thought I was going to use law school to get there, but I um, also like knew that I wasn't ever going to like, you know, actually take the bar. Like I didn't want to be like that type of lawyer. I just wanted that like pedigree to be able to kind of get me there. So um, uh, I, I think after some time and um, some work experience, um, it really was able to uh, kind of make it clear for me that an MBA was probably the best way for me to kind of get to those points uh, that I wanted to be at. And um, I know there was a question in the chat about work experience. I can't, um, and I know um, Jordan also mentioned it, I can't, um, uh, state how important having like some work experience is just because um, as somebody who, you know, values education a lot, was in school for um, five years, it was, uh, it, I think the biggest growth I had personally and professionally was when I was like out working and understanding like this is how you really interact out in the real world outside of a research environment. And so for me, those experiences really helped shape and define like this is what I wanted to do um, a lot better. So um, I, I, those are some areas I just wanted to highlight um, for you. Great, thank you. Very helpful information. Um, anyone else about this question? Otherwise we can move forward. Okay, great, I'm just gonna move on then. Um, so this next question is just about the application process. Um, what? How, when did you get started? How early did you get started? And how many schools you applied to, things like that. So feel free to jump in. I, well, I wouldn't recommend doing it the way that I did. I applied to six schools and I did it in about a uh, little over, it was like a month and a half. Um, but that was, again, because I didn't, I didn't know a single person who had an MBA. I didn't know what the process was supposed to look like. Uh, I didn't have panel panels like this at uh, Oregon State to kind of help me figure out what the pathway should look, look like. And I just got done running a race and I thought, you know, uh, end of November to beginning of January was plenty of time to get six done. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't recommend it for a lot of the people that I've talked to. Um, it really varies based on how long you think you need for like the GMAT, for example, uh, slash GRE. Some people, a lot of people are taking the GRE these days. Um, you know, that can be anywhere from uh, a couple months to six months. And, um, you know, I would say that the application process is going to take longer than you think. With the with the six, I wish I would have had probably just for the applications. I wish I would have had at least three or four months just to sit down and think and really refine what I was saying. Um, 
even silly things as a as a transfer student you know i had three community colleges that i had to call up and find transcripts from some of which i hadn't attended in nine years so you know it's uh, that stuff gets that's challenging so i would say just uh, give yourself some time okay great thank you i'll, I'll, I'll say uh, if I, if I say I'll be, I'm on the opposite spectrum of him. So I took over two years in applying and, and I'll, I'll, I'm gonna open about my journey. So I was first applied to this program called MLT, which um, if any, um, what the requirements are to be of Latino, African-American descent or Native American descent, but it's a program that um, helps people get into top business schools. So I went through that first, you apply to that before you go to business school. I went, got to MLT, um, it's like weird in programs, but like a national version of it. Um, I applied to six schools my first year um, and I got rejected to five of them and including Haas and GSB, which are here. And I was gonna go to another school which was ranked in the twenties. I won't say the name cause I, it's not right. Um, I guess, too, but um, I didn't feel like I want, I wasn't excited about going there. Um, I just, just being honest, um, it, it was, it was on the East Coast, um, just a little bit more background about me, I have kids. So moving my family to, um, to that city um, uh, um, seemed like too sudden. So I did reapply again, um, again to six schools. Um, this time I got into, I got into two waitlisted here at Anderson actually, uh, to believe it or not. Um, and so I, I had reapplied, to, so I applied just like kindergarten. The second time I did it was, was the charm. So the second time that I applied to Haas um, worked out for me. And, and again, it was just, um, it was, for me, it was maybe a two, the opposite of Jordan, the process was a little too long and it was getting too um, exasperated. So, so I also do think taking a multi-year approach, um, it's a, it becomes a marathon. Okay, great, thank you. And then um, if anyone else feels comfortable about sharing their process of applications. Yeah, I, I definitely can. And would lo also love to hear um, from Robin too, because it's just a really important thing to hear different like experiences um, people have um, in applying because you'll see that it's like, there's no one path and there's no one process that fits everybody. Um, so for me, um, I think it was probably a medium between like Douglas and Jordan, uh, definitely not two years and definitely not a month and a half. Um, and I ended up applying um, round three, um, which uh, we can definitely talk about the different rounds. So um, uh, there's typically in a MBA uh, like application cycle, there's three rounds. Like the first round is like in um, the fall, uh, second round is in January timeframe, and then third round is around March. Um, this year, because of COVID and also last year, they have, most schools have a fourth round, um, which goes into like June, I, I, I'd say, I, I can't recall the exact date, um, or perhaps it's May, it's probably May, sorry. Um, but um, uh, so we can definitely talk about the pros and cons of like applying for which rounds. Um, so I got waitlisted round three um, and then ended up applying like in the full cycle in uh, waiting a full cycle. So uh, applied round two the next year. Um, and so the schools that I was looking at were um, I looked at the top 10 schools, um, took out the California schools and then um, applied to those. So that's still quite a lot. Um, don't recommend it uh, for everybody because it's very expensive. And I also highly recommend looking at um, uh, application fee waivers um, that because application fees are typically about $200, $250 per school. And that's really hefty. It really adds up. Um, and so just make sure you try and like minimize the cost of applying as much as possible. And um, and so was able to get interviews at, I think at like six or five or six different programs and then ended up um, uh, getting uh, my uh, offers like with dual degree programs um, at three schools. Um, and so I think what was really important then was kind of using the interview process, um, like the uh, visits to campus, talking to different students to really figure out like what's the right feel for me. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, like Douglas mentioned, like if it doesn't fit for you that program, you're probably not gonna enjoy your 
two years there. Like you should really feel joy. I always call it like my, if anybody watches say yes to the dress, like it should be your say yes to the dress moment. Like you should feel like this is the place that you belong. Um, and you should feel a lot of genuine joy um, that you're um, at this program. Um, and that's what I, exactly what I felt like when I stepped into um, Michigan Ross on the coldest, um, ugliest April day um, in Michigan. Um, and I loved it. So, um, so, so that, that was my experience there. Awesome. Thank you. And if you don't mind me asking, uh, what made you not want to apply to any of the California schools? I had grown up in California um, okay. and yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, and then Robin, if you had anything to share regarding your experience. Um, Arrow's putting me on the spot. I actually, had a, you know, I, I wanted, I wanted to leave California. Truth be told, I wanted to leave California because I thought the uh, cost of living was inflated beyond um, what was logical. Um, ironically, I'm, I'm going to go <laughs> to UC Berkeley, um, and I'm happy to tell you why. Um, but basically, um, I think I applied to 10. Um, and looking back, it was too many. Um, I had a coach in MLT, and we're required to apply to three schools. So um, I just wanted to have options in case that something went awry. And um, you apply, if you're part of this organization called the consortium, um, you can apply to up to six schools with one application. So the common application. And I'm sure Doug is gonna post a, a link. I see him nodding. <laughs> so uh, Doug and I are both consortium fellows, which means that we apply through this organization. And uh, instead of uh, paying six to six schools separately, you can apply through one. Uh, application. So it saves a lot of time and it takes a lot of the, you know, the, the grunt work, for lack of a better term, of applying to, to business school. I'm sure that uh, Jordan and, Aver and uh, um, Averill can attest to this, that it's very time consuming. And if it had not been for the common application, I would have applied, as Jordan did, probably just a handful of schools because it's, it's not man manageable and the return on investment, it just plummets without the consortium application, at least from my experience. I'll just add to Robin, yeah, at a certain point it becomes too much because um, or else you're not putting your best foot forward. Um, at, at a, like all of them get diluted indirectly. Un unless you hire a consultant, they charge three grand each. So, but if that's your thing, Okay, thank you. Go. Oh, sorry, Robin, do you want to add something? Yeah, I want to add something to that. If you can afford having a consultant, and you see it, I mean, you're going to business school, you're applying to business school. If you see it as a return on investment, um, you know, I apply and I spend, you know, $6,000 for a consultant. I, I personally didn't pay because I didn't have the funds to do so. But um, somebody has the money or, you know, you got somebody who wants to host you uh, or help you out or you have some savings. I think this is a good way to use the savings, hiring somebody to help you if you feel like, it's something that will get out of your hands and you want to be able to uh, do it the way that you want to do it. I would definitely go with a consultant the first time. Don't do it by yourself and then do it with a consultant the second time. I would say do it with a consultant from the beginning if you wish to do so. But if you're part of MLT, if you're part of the consortium, if you're part of the Reardon programs, I think you have enough guidance um, that you don't really need the, the consultant. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Avril on the spot on this one and see what she thinks about it. She might have different thoughts. I see, I see a smile there. I, I'm not a fan of uh, business school consult, like application consultants general, I, I don't know. Um, I, I just have very strong personal opinions about it. And um, I'm also, um, you know, I grew up in uh, like grew up in India, so I uh, oftentimes field a lot of questions from international students who are very interested in um, having these consultants. Um, I think oftentimes um, the MBA admissions committees can really easily see through um, a um, application that is engineered to look like it's being, you know, 
it's trying to show like what an MBA student looks like. And one of the best advices um, that, uh, you know, I, I got when I was talking to a lot of different schools is to be your authentic self um, and to be the person who like uh, you, you really want to be. And I, I definitely think like um, to your point, uh, Robin, about like the consultants can definitely like uh, polish uh, aspects of your um, application or can definitely highlight things that uh, perhaps you didn't have access to. Um, I think a lot of those um, resources can also be met like by talking to a lot of students, by having conversations with ADCOM, uh, which is the admissions committees um, and things like that. Um, it, applying to business school is really expensive. I just think those funds could be used elsewhere, but that's just me. Awesome, thank you. Um, I know this next question, I, you guys might've touched on it earlier and uh, Doug and Robin, you might have some similar answers, but I just wanted to know um, if there were any specific aspects of the MBA program you guys are in that drew you towards it. Um, Avril, I know you were saying earlier that you just wanna have that true connection to your program. So was there anything that stood out to you guys about your specific school? Well, I'll look at it from the, I'm just giving you the truth the beginning and I'll say how it, I probably approached it the wrong way. Um, but I looked at all the schools that I got accepted, uh, which one's the highest ranking and which one gave me the most money. And that's it, it's as simple as that. Um, however, looking further, I do think community matters. Um, I do think there's certain schools that would not have been a good fit for me just because um, Again, the, for me, the first thing is family. I have family. Um, certain schools, I, I would have not, not been able to be part of the community as much as I am now. So I kind of got lucked into that. I, I do believe Haas has one of the best. And I'm just saying is to say, but I do believe Haas has, Haas has one of the best student cultures um, out of all the MBA schools. And so I kind of lucked into it, but that was not my priority when I was choosing schools. Doug, quick question. What's the name of that uh, conference every year that happened? That used to happen at UCLA exclusively? Oh, yeah. The, uh, so there's a, um, there's a conference run by Reardon, and I was part of that committee as well. It's called the Diversity MBA Admissions Conference, or DMAC. Um, it happens around August, I believe, every year. Um, the last year was virtual, and I think this year is going to be virtual as well. But it's a great way to, I think it costs like $100. And it's a great way to meet um, admissions officers from the top 25 business schools, including the three schools that are featured here. And um, you get to meet um, the admissions officer, which I believe, I don't know, this is my opinion. I don't think admissions officers like the best data because obviously um, admissions officers are selling you on their program. And you know, at the end of the day, they're salespeople. But um, Sometimes they can be the entry point to getting contacts. Um, I do believe getting alumni, which you have so, so share similar attributes are important. And sometimes um, uh, admissions officers can be that gateway. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, anyone else wanted to share? Yeah, I'm happy to share. Uh, I think that there's, there's a lot of good things. Uh, you know, I, when I sat down to look at the, the schools that I got into and was thinking about where I wanted to go, um, I think the, the real uh, prestige was motivating for me, money was motivating for me. Uh, I think what really separated Stanford was the reputation and the amount of funding that goes into entrepreneurship uh, and, and innovation. It's definitely something that has separated it in the past, um, not just its proximity to Silicon Valley, but just the school itself and the programming that they have around it. Um, and, but I also definitely want to re-emphasize the, the community aspect and the culture. The, the schools really do, this is not something I appreciated when I was going through it the first time, but uh, I'm, you know, I kind of, I had some good reasons and some bad reasons for coming to Stanford. And I look back now though, and I think, you know, when I look at places like Harvard and others, I, I don't think I would have been happy there. I think I would have been a fish out of water um, and it just didn't fit my personality. Whereas Stanford, um, I love, and some of my best friends are here and there's definitely a, um, 
a milieu and a theme that kind of runs through and kind of ties us all together. Um, and I think that's really important because you are going to spend two years of your life here, at least, and unless you're doing a joint degree like me and you're a glutton for punishment, uh, like April as well. Uh, I think you're, you know, it's a long, it's a lot of time. So you really want to make sure that you're in a place that you actually just enjoy being. All right, thank you. Anyone else wants to share about their school or the program they're in? Yeah, I'm always happy to um, upsell Ross. Um, so I, I think, you know, like I mentioned, community is something um, you'll hear. Um, and definitely, I think when you speak to different students, you'll hear every MBA program is collaborative. Everybody is like so nice. Everyone pays it forward. And that's great. You should definitely be hearing these things when you're applying to schools. Um, if you're not, that's always a concern. Um, uh, I think what you'll kind of see too, that's uh, really important, um, at least for me uh, that I loved about Ross was uh, they have a really heavy emphasis on experiential learning. Um, so they have this program called um, the uh, Multidisciplinary Action Project. So that's essentially, um, we're also on a quarter system. So we have four quarters in our first year of our MBA program and one quarter is dedicated to doing a 10 week consulting project for um, a company like anywhere around the world. Um, so like, you know, I had uh, classmates work for Uber, I worked for Tencent, um, people worked on startups, like you know, all kinds of things. And so the school places like a really heavy emphasis on like, you know, you can learn every, everything you want in the classroom, but it's really important for you to actually practice it out in the real world. Um, and I really like that. I like the flexibility, especially as somebody who was doing such a drastic career switch in my mind, I just wanted as much work experience as possible. So for me, I was actually able to have an internship or work um, in some capacity almost every semester I was at school. Um, and as a result, like uh, anytime I do interviews, people would say like, oh my gosh, you've done so much in these uh, past couple of years. And that was a result of like the um, environment at Ross. Um, I think the other thing that's also really important is that um, it's important to evaluate the people that you're around. So pay special attention when you're doing your MBA interviews um, and when you're, um, you know, hopefully uh, have your admit weekends uh, and really evaluate the people around you. And I always tell people like, are these folks that you want to be in a class with for the next two years? Are these people who you'd want to be your colleagues? Are these people that you'd want to work for? Are these people that you'd want to hire? Because that's what the MBA does. It's, it just creates a network, not just for those two years, but for the rest of your life, because you'll see a lot of the jobs that you get are all referral based, right? It's all in your network. Um, it's who knows who and who they can connect you with. Um, so as a result, um, if you find yourself really deeply connecting with that community, that just makes your um, chance of pivoting into a certain sec a sector opportunity all the more stronger. So um, really think about evaluating it on those um, aspects as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And then I just also wanted to address one of the questions that was sent to me earlier that's um, somewhat relevant at this point so we don't lose track of it. Um, Rachel asked if there's any uh, advice that you guys have on getting into an MBA program when you don't have a background or a major that was related to business? I don't, I don't think, um, oh, you wanna go ahead, Um, oh, you, go ahead. you step up, you step up. Okay, I, I don't think schools are business MBA programs are looking for a specific major. And I, and I, I know it sounds cliche, but I, I do believe it. Like Jordan's earlier point, like schools look for diversity and not just of color but like diversity of like, we have a lot of military people in, in, in um, we have a lot of people that are, are overseas, um, type of diversity, people that, that are entrepreneurs, did their own businesses. And so ma the mayor, mayor, your major is one of the, the diversity as well. So like in, in my class, you have humanities, people that were art majors, photography, and we also have engineers from IIT. So like, like we have everything and and, and, I, and I and I actually do think that's a benefit having diversity because a lot of the um, a, a lot of the like class discussions are like based on the case system and you realize like when you're doing the case system having different viewpoints um, only augments um, the discussion and the quality of education. Got it. Thank you. Go ahead, Robin. And to add to that, um, the case method is a, a manner of instruction, essentially. 
Um, instead of being lectured to like you are in college, nothing wrong with lectures, perfectly fine. And you raise your hand and the professor calls in you and then you, know, you try to get brownie points or extra credit, certainly did that. Um, in, in business school, you get called on, uh, you get cold called. Um, and there's a case, well, sometimes you get cold called, sometimes you volunteer. Um, there's a case that gets uh, sent out to you and you read it. Uh, for example, I think I got one that was on uh, real estate development. I'm looking into uh, real estate as a post MBA career. And so I said uh, something about a development and a property and we had to look into how to develop a property, whether it was an appropriate investment, how to navigate the political system with the, the local government. And um, based on kind of the profile that you have coming in from undergrad, for example, uh, if Doug studied uh, mathematics, uh, forgive me if I got it mixed up, uh, Doug, but it was a quant heavy subject. So uh, for somebody such as Doug, when the teacher has something that's related to mathematics, might call on him. Um, well, if somebody else was a lawyer before or somebody else was a, uh, you know, a real estate manager, if it, there's something uh, to be discussed about development, then he may call on me. And if there's a legal question, he may call on the lawyer, et cetera. Not to say you need to be a lawyer or that you know, lawyers are prominent in law school. There are some lawyers, but I don't want to discourage anybody from applying. Yeah, I have, a, I have something to add, just a slight nuance to it. Well, first, I have a guy in my class who plays, uh, he went to Juilliard and he plays second violin for, I think it's the Boston Orchestra. So I don't think anybody could have a more orthogonal background and uh, education and profession than he does to business school. So, and, and he got in and he's doing just fine. Uh, so wherever you're at, you're good. The second thing I would say is um, completely agree they're looking for diversity. The one thing I will say, if you do not have a traditional background, you have to give a little bit more thought to why you're applying to business school. Because if you just come in and you say, I, I want to do it because, you know, I think I'd like to, I'd be good in business and I'd like to pivot. Um, it's not a very compelling narrative. They want to know that you've really thought about why you want to move from wherever you're in to business school and how the, you, you got to connect the dots for them because it's not, there's a trend, some stuff gets lost in translation. Um, so just be a little bit more explicit about that and a little bit more thoughtful uh, in your application. But not, not a not a reason not to apply. Awesome, thank you guys for that advice. Um, so I kind of want to take a turn here and talk about some of the uh, challenges or even negative aspects of your MBA experience. Um, I hear you smiling, Robin. Maybe you have something to add to that. <laughs> um, I was I was smiling at a at a message that I got. From, oh, okay. <laughs> from uh from avril i was asking her about the pronunciation of her name and she said like avril levine so i was gonna put a, <laughs> an avril levine song pun in there i thought it would be hilarious uh, so i actually missed the, the question that you asked uh Jana, oh. would you please ask it again yeah of course of course i was just gonna say if you guys could talk about some of the challenges or um, just negative aspects of the experience something that was particularly difficult yeah um i think self-doubt insecurity, um, thinking that people are better than you, that there's always somebody else who's more qualified, um, thinking that there's always something that could be better about your application. There's no such thing as a perfect application, uh, no such thing as a perfect GMAT or perfect timing. There is better timing or worse timing if you think about it, but I think expecting perfection is uh, is really really challenging. Um, surrounding yourself with people who are applying and are going through the same struggles and can understand that you're not going to be as available as you were before, uh, I think that's a big big um, positive factor that can help you cope with the application. But it's it's pretty heavy, and uh, but it can be done. You just have to be diligent about it and break it out into. Um, you know, more manageable chunks rather than try to do it all at once. You can't cram to apply to business school. Uh, I would have to add about the business school experience. I, would, I wouldn't want to say negative, but here's some things that you need to be aware of, especially you as community college students. Like you, you might have felt a, a class shock when you were you went from community college to, to UCLA, right? 
well, that jump is going to be much bigger from the jump in terms of prestige and, and like class division between community college and UCLA. The is the jump and the jump from UCLA to Berkeley Haas was the second one was much bigger. And just to give you examples, like one of my classmates, her dad is owns a company that's worth three billion. And like, and, and, that, and that's a Haas, which we're actually, when it comes to that, like Haas is not typically, we're considered like the hippie school. And, um, but even then we have a lot, there's a lot of, um, I'll give you one perspective that I don't, I feel like it should be noted. Like there's Latinos at Haas, but there's a difference between Latinos that were born in the US and Latinos that come from Latin America. And it's a lot of, it's, it comes down to class. Like, you know, their parents are own empresas and that I would say it's probably like a big, the biggest culture shock. I wouldn't say it's as a negative, but it's just, it, it's there. And, um, and I know at other schools like um, Wharton and I'll even put GSB and HBS and MIT like that, from what I've heard from classmates that are there, like it's even bigger the like, like you have classmates that are like, oh, wow, that's like, I didn't know that you were related to this president or this billionaire. And so, um, that that's a that I think that's going to be true regardless of what top business school you go to though. Um, you're just going to be a class component. And for me, that I grew up on my my parents were grew up on EBT. I know what EBT is. Like a lot of my classmates don't know what EBT card is, um, or WIC. If you if you, um, I'll just leave it at that. I wanted to just sorry add on to Douglas's point because I think that's really important. Um, um, it's something that I faced as well, um, and it's uh, you'll hear the term like imposter syndrome. Uh, it's basically this feeling that you uh, don't feel like you belong. You honestly like you question like why you're here. You think that perhaps like the admissions committee has made a mistake, or um, you just have a lot of self doubt um, because of the circumstances um, of your life, or just you know I think when you see the fact that like you your classmate is a billionaire or like perhaps you go to a school where everybody on the weekends goes to some like incredible holiday for me um I didn't travel at all like during my three years at grad school and I felt like I was out of place because everybody else had like very fabulous Instagrams and I'm like I'm too poor um I got loans to pay like I cannot afford um to do any of this um so um, a, a story that I'll tell you is that like my orientation week, um, I, um, I like I think I went to my first day of orientation, came back home, called my mom and like cried for like two hours because I was like, I don't belong here every like they've made a mistake like this is just like not for me um and then the second day we had like um for our orientation we had this um thing at ross that's called um the impact challenge basically we do again a short consulting project and our client was amazon and um, my team's project like we got to represent my section and then our section got to compete like against the entire mba class and it was because of my contributions um that literally we got to that place so that's what you'll find is this experience in MBA is like sometimes you'll hit like some huge lows where you're like questioning your existence, especially during recruiting. Um, and then there are other times where you're like, um, you'll hit huge highs where like everybody comes to you, people like um, want to know like more about like how you solve these problems. And I think um, it's again, really important for you to kind of um, have a really strong sense of who you are, uh, especially in moments like when you find yourself challenged or find yourself questioning things um, and really rely on your support system, um, whether that's um, family, whether that's a significant other, uh, whether that's the community that you build at the school or um, even at, uh, at um, uh, UCLA where you find yourself. Um, because it's really important um, uh, to have that network, um, especially like in moments when self-doubt can rise. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing everyone. Um, so I also wanted to talk about the class sizes that you guys looked for, if your particular school had a large or small um, average class size and how that affected your experience. Just feel free to go ahead if you have anything to share. I'll make it quick not to hog, but um, if you compare the top 15 schools, Haas, is, Haas and Tuck, which is a school called Dartmouth, it's in New Hampshire, we're, we're, we're like the tiniest. Um, we're like at 280. And we were divided into four cohorts of, my class was divided into four cohorts of 80. Um, and so I think we're at the low end. Um, I, I think 
I actually would have preferred a larger class, but I, one of the advantages of a small class is that you get to know a lot of your classmates, especially your section mates. So and the resources are spread less thin, but the network's smaller. Got it, thank you. Um, anyone else wanna hop in on that? Talk about class size. Go ahead. Stanford's is larger, uh, but not, it's also considered a pretty small class size. Ours typically is around 415. And I would say, uh, I actually like it about that size. It's it's about the size where you, you can't meet everybody in your class uh, and that you, you start to have to form stronger bonds with your section mates and there's little clusters of social spheres. Um, but the, you know, this is a, this is something that I would recommend you look into. It's not just the class size, but the quality of the alumni network and how bought in they are. Um, and I've heard similar things from Haas. I don't know as many people from Michigan, but I know in Stanford, uh, our school size, our class size is about a third the size of uh, Harvard. And, you know, I think Wharton's is roughly the same as Harvard's, but um, so the, the network is bigger, but you, you know, when I pick up a phone and I call cold call a uh, Stanford, alum, there's like a 90% chance that they're going to pick up and they're going to help me out even if they're the CEO of some massive company. Um, so it's, I think it's depth and quality. It's not, uh, it's not how large it is that matters. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I just want to hop to one of the questions in the chat um, so that we don't lose that. So Brianna asked, uh, how did you guys discover or choose your end game career or what you plan on doing post MBA? Uh, I, I still haven't. Okay, got it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a resource uh, that I know of. I'm looking it up though. I don't remember off the top of my head. I will come back to it. Okay, no worries. Um, if anyone wants to, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to go. I think this was a big, this was a big journey of self-discovery for me because I was, I was, I knew I didn't want to do politics anymore. I wanted to be involved in some way, uh, but that was not where I wanted my profession to be. Uh, and you know, when I sat down to kind of map it out, the way that I thought about it was, um, your the job you do will change throughout your life and there's almost no way to chart that uh, and but your principles and things that you care about and the things that make you happy in life are usually pretty consistent um, you know there are things like I knew I wanted to always learn uh, I knew I wanted to do something that would change the world uh, you know so those were kind of the the lens and the way I kind of looked at it is like I wanted a compass not a map and you know sometimes we sit out and draw a map and it's like you know the map is always changing and it's hard to get all the details right but as long as i have a compass eventually i'll end up where i want to be and i think that that's that's a better way to approach picking one and then at some point i would say don't succumb to paralysis by analysis just pick one right in your application vast majority of applicants change like they do not they do not go into the career field that they put on their application so don't don't get too uh anxious about you know picking the right one and having to stick to it yeah i want to definitely echo jordan's point is that the um oftentimes you'll see for different uh, programs they'll ask you like what are your short-term um mba goals long-term things like career goals and the idea is to suss out like what you're thinking of post mba um you're definitely not beholden to that like um you know i talked about a very specific role um in the mobility space working with autonomous vehicles um and i got to actually do that and i realized like no i want to do something else um and i think that's the whole point of the mba experience is that you get, get to use your internship and kind of try out different things and see if that's a good fit for you or not. Um, and oftentimes, like you'll see the internship that you get for your um, uh, in your MBA summer uh, between your first and second year. Um, some people end up re-recruiting because they're like, that's not the company that I like, that's not the role that I want to do. And that's just not the, the change. Um, for me, um, I had an exposure to venture capital and I never thought of myself as a financial services person. I was like, I'm not an iBanker. I don't like any of that. That's just not for me. Um, but then I got to do early stage um, investing and I loved it. Um, and I love the fact that I could kind of carve out a niche for myself in the mobility space. Um, and then I 
got to like have a couple other internships in uh, venture capital. Um, so it really kind of confirmed like that's what I wanted to do long term. Um, and then I thought about like what are some different ways to kind of do that? Do I want to go right into industry or do I uh, want to use um, consulting as an option? And so um, I decided that consulting and speaking to some mentors, they told me that consulting um, allows you to kind of explore some analogous industries, look at some different edge cases and kind of just learn and explore for a couple of years. And I decided that that was a good fit for me and um, uh, use that. Um, but I, I also want to say statistically, like the job you have, like post MBA, you'll only have it for about two years. Um, you'll move on to something else. So like, don't feel that you are stuck into a company or stuck into a role or anything um you're honestly it's just like one step into the rest of your life thank you it's definitely a relief to hear that <laughs> um and then i have a specific question towards jordan from one of the audience members um anthony had a question about any tips to get the stanford knight hennessy scholarship since it is very uh competitive and prestigious if you have any tips for that yeah, um, that would be, I think, a whole other panel all by itself because it is, it is a, that in review, that application process actually was even harder than the one I went through for business school. Um, so I will say a couple quick points and then, um, you know, I'm happy to, uh, John, I'm happy to provide, you have my email. I'm happy to um, follow up via email as well with some more detailed advice. But I would say the Knight Hennessy, uh, scholarship, the biggest thing they're trying to do is they're trying to build essentially an American Rhodes scholarship. And so if you can kind of think of it in those terms, it helps you give it, it gives you an idea of the environment they're trying to shape and the, the people that are going to help build the program that they want and the legacy that they want. Um, and so to that end, think about the um, once you have that kind of in your head, you think about okay, what voice do I bring to that community that is very unique that nobody else brings, uh, and what am I going to get out of it that is that's going to uh, set me apart? Uh, and then you know the the third thing is that uh, and then this I think you know was so on the second piece the fact that I was political was a big deal for them, right? The fact that I could say like look you're going to have a bunch of people who want to talk about changing the world, but I've actually written laws and I know how to get it through the hydraulics of the state legislature or, or Congress or whatever. Um, you know, I'm, I can partner with that community and kind of help be the hands to the voice. And, um, and then the third is, you know, it, it, what was really appealing to me was I liked the cross academic pollination, right? I didn't want to come to business school and only hang out with business school people. There's a homogenizing effect that happens at the business school that makes, you know, you all come in from all these different countries and with all these different backgrounds and everything else, and you all come out sounding uh, exactly the same and using all the same words and talking about private equity and VC and all, you know. And so I really wanted to make sure that I exposed myself to uh, other communities, other academic communities that saw the world through a different lens. And um, Finding a way to emphasize that, you know, the community, the cross academic pollination, um, and then, you know, there's more, but that's, those are the quick points. And, you know, if you want more, send me an email. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank and you. then, so was someone going to say something? Okay. Um, there was also an audience question from before from Catherine um, to whoever this applies to. How did you decide you wanted to do a dual degree instead of a traditional MBA? That one's for Jordan. Anyone want to? Is that for me or that? is that for uh, Apple? Sorry, I didn't hear. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I, uh, again, I kind of, it. this was very similar to the, the Night Hennessy thing where I really wanted to expose myself to other thoughts. Um, and when I came in, you know, going back to like the guiding principles, I really wanted to work on something that I felt like was going to change the world and energy and the environment, sustainability, climate change kind of fit that mold. Um, and I didn't want to be one of those stereotypical business people that kind of came in and, and said like, hey, I'm going to, you know, take the idea of the engineer and I'm going to make a ton of money off of it. I wanted to actually have some technical 
fluency and buy-in and uh, value add that uh, that you couldn't get from you know simply just taking business school classes and learning finance. Um, so it's a combination of wanting to be exposed to different ways of looking at the world and different people and wanting to equip myself with that technical skill set so that I could actually be more conversant and provide value outside of simply the leadership and the, the business fundamentals that I was bringing to the table. Yeah, I'll just quickly add that, uh, like for me, um, uh, I think I wanted perhaps like a softer segue from like uh, my work um, in the public sector before into business. Um, and since I was doing a switch um, into diff a different industry as well, um, I kind of used my um, public policy degree to gain subject matter expertise um, in another field. So I focused on emerging technology um, and so that it was really valuable. And I think for me personally, since I had such a heavy emphasis on gaining as much work experience, I needed the expertise extra summer to have another um, internship and so was lucky enough to like you know work for General Motors on their electrification strategy and that helped me kind of make that story for like other pitches as well um, so I, I think it just better fit like my need to just have some more time and kind of experience more things um, uh, just personally. Got it thanks so much. Um, and if anyone else in the audience wants to send over any questions, um, go ahead and do so. So we make sure to get to that. Um, but just a few more here to go. So I know Doug had touched on this earlier in the chat, but just so that we can um, get this information to everybody, just wanted to get some uh, tips on if you recommend students applying to a deferred program or waiting until later. I think Doug stepped away for a moment. Oh, if God. you're not, oh, sorry, I got to answer. Sorry, I'm on the phone now because we're going somewhere on I a know. date with my wife. Um, if you're not applying through a deferral program that you can apply straight through, I would recommend waiting at least two years, maybe three, the mid, the, at, at, a, at a minimum. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to ask a few questions about um, the social aspects of the school. So, you know, just kind of talk about the work-life balance um, and how much time you had for things like traveling, social life, things like that. And anyone can answer this. Do you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> okay. right, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, just wanted to um, get some advice on, or tips, I guess, on the social life balance, um, how much time you had for traveling and social life, things like that. At business school or before? When you were doing MBA, yeah. Yeah, during the MBA, it, the MBA is, uh, has earned a reputation for being a party degree and being where there's a lot of socializing that happens. Um, some of that is exaggeration and, um, you know, inflation, but uh, there is a lot of truth to it. There's a lot of networking that goes on. So there is a, um, it, it depends a little bit on what school you go to as well. Uh, it's not the same across schools, but I can tell you definitely at Stanford and, and the friends that I have at other schools, there's a profound emphasis on partying and hanging out and traveling and networking and um and it's not that everybody does it but there's a lot of that that goes on um i i will say for me academics were very important um getting to know professors uh networking with alumni and with the right business organizations um were far more important to me than than spending 100 percent of my time just traveling all, everywhere so I would say I spent um, probably 30% of my time socializing, traveling, hanging out, and then you know the other 70% was divided among the academics and networking with alumni and professors and things like that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead, Avril. Sorry, I just wanted to say a one big differentiator is that perhaps like if you've been working before um, school, like, you know, you have your nine to five, you have your weekends, that's kind of protected space. When you're in school, I'm, I'm sure you guys are all feeling it right now. It's like school is 24 seven. And so that's similar to um, 
just like being in business school. Um, so it's really important to like set boundaries for yourself. Um, and so uh, time management, if that's a skill that you don't have right now, um, uh, you will definitely be forced into it uh, by the time you're in business school. Awesome, yeah. thank you. From my perspective, so I have a, when I started business school, I had two children, now I have a third one. So for me, I, I kind of, I had to deprioritize a lot of stuff, including academics and partying uh, because of family type. Uh, that, 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 that is my, always been my biggest priority. But having said that, there is a way to um, squeeze it all in. And I think it, it's just as Avril was saying, just prior, uh, prioritize and time management, which I'm still getting working on. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and then I know uh, may have touched on this earlier more just about the application fees and stuff, but there was a question about um, any tips on finding ways to fund your MBA or how to get one if you're not getting scholarship opportunities, things like that. I mean, I'll say one, one of the good things about an MBA is that uh, like there are people that there are companies that do private loans and because an MBA is looked like they know that an MBA is a good ROI. You usually it would not be very hard to get fully funded by borrowing. Um, I had the the honor to get a my tuition paid by the consortium fellowship. So like that that um that application where you see the all the consortium schools, um, you are eligible to apply for a fellowship. And so Haas and Ross are both members of the consortium. And there's other benefits besides the full fellowship, such as early recruiting and so forth. Awesome. Yeah, Robin, go ahead. I'm going to agree with Avril on this one. I think that people don't like to talk about their finances. Um, and it's very, uh, I mean, it's like people don't want to tell you, right? So, I mean, I want to give Doug props for, I mean, disclosing a scholarship. Uh, that's... Uh, something that's not very common in, to do. Um, but you can get your employer uh, also to get part, uh, pay part of your tuition if your employer supports that kind of experience. Um, you can apply for outside scholarships. You can apply for scholarships in your industry. For example, personally, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in real estate. So I reached out to organizations that are real estate based and a couple of them had training uh, scholarships, others had um, housing scholarships. And so it, it's just, a, it's a hunting game. I mean, you either have to work to pay for the tuition uh, or if you have the money to pay it or get a loan, it, it ends up being a combination of those. Um, or you can uh, apply for scholarships. I personally thought it, scholarships were king and I just applied to um, a few outside of the consortium. Um, like Douglas, I, I'm a consortium fellow, so I got, I had my tuition paid for, uh, and that's why I highly, highly recommend the consortium program. And if anybody has specific questions about that program, I'm happy to answer them either now or later. I know we're short on time. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, yes, we are coming to an end. So I'm going to move on to the audience questions to make sure we get all of those answered. So Anthony had asked if you have any tips for studying for the GMAT, um, breaking a 700 is tough. I, I can start, sorry, I don't know if anybody raised because I'm on the phone. So I did break 700. I think my best advice would be, uh, be very strategic. Um, there's different levels of studying. So like there's a level of where you are studying to know the material. And there is a level where you're studying to know how to get better at taking a test. And again, the GMAT does not measure your intelligence. I can tell you there's a handful of people at, at my school that got 600s that are probably smarter than me. I was just good at taking tests. That, that's it. It doesn't mean that you're... And one more thing, schools don't care. Most employers do not care what your GMAT score is once you get there. Um, so just get good at taking the test and... And um, for me, most of my studying, when I got to that latter stage of just getting better at test taking, it was just doing the, the, the OG, I call it the OG guide, which is the original guide that's provided by the GMATs and two supplemental book, books and just doing real GMAT problems. 
I think that's probably once you know the material and your foundation. For me, in my personal opinion, that's the best you can get better at taking the test. Okay, great. Thanks so much. The original GMAT guide and what else? The two what? There's two supplementals. I think there's a quantitative supplemental and then there's the verbal supplemental. I think I did 80% of all three, but I, I didn't even do all of it. Thank you. Thanks. And then uh, Robin, did you want to add to that? Or was your hand just raised from before? I wasn't sure. Oh, I'm sorry, it was raised from before. I okay, don't want to, nice. I don't want to um, monopolize. So if uh, Avril or Jordan want to share something, you know, I'll step back on this one. Okay, no worries. Um, yeah, if we don't have anything more to add to that, I can move on to, I believe, our last question from the audience. Um, if you guys have any more, please send them in now. Otherwise, we're going to have to um, end the event pretty soon. So Rachel had asked um, if you suggest taking the GMAT or the GRE and why. I would take whichever one you like more. There, most of the schools now, uh, I you know do a little bit of research just to be just to be sure that the, if you have a particular school you want to go to, that they have a policy that they accept both. Uh, but from what I've seen recently, most schools uh, actively accept both and don't discriminate. And so it really just de depends on, you know, to Douglas's point earlier, it's, they're both tests. They both teach you how to take a test. And so if it's speaking your language, do the GRE. And if not, then go to the GMAT. I would say generally, then this is kind of a gross oversimplification. The GMAT is a little bit more quant heavy uh, and the GRE is a little less uh, heavy on the quant. Um, but, you know, they're both, they're, they're, the differences are pretty marginal. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up. Take the test that you will do the best in. And once you take a sample of each, you, you, you'll, you'll know which one to study. And yeah, it, I would say five years ago, the GMAT was preferred, but now, honestly, wow. the schools accept both. There is no, there is no preference for schools now. Yeah, I took the GRE and, you know, got in. All right, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, I believe that's all we have as far as um, questions from the audience. I think um, there might be a couple more. Oh yeah, I think we have. Let's see. Um, this was directed towards Robin. Why do you recommend target test prep? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> oh, I think you. No problem, no problem. Um, I would do what Doug said, uh, take a diagnostic test. So you can take a practice test of the GRE and one of the GMAT um, and see which one you have the best score in to begin with and which one you're more proficient in. Uh, the test, it, it tests your ability um, to persevere uh, it tests your ability to focus. It tests your ability to, it tries to trick you um, because it's adaptive. So if you see that you're getting a lot of questions right, it's like, oh, look at this woman. She's getting a lot of these questions right. So I'm going to throw a harder question. So, and then based on that question, it, it gauges how you respond. And it gets to the point where you're answering about half of the questions correctly and half incorrectly. And then it says, okay, this is about your score because this is where your, your um, skill splits. The score is a reflection of your skill. It's not a reflection of your aptitude. It's not a reflection of your intelligence. It's not a reflection of the major that you had, although some math people may have more exposure to um, certain courses in math. But when you go into target pet, uh, test prep, there's absolutely no need for any knowledge other than arithmetic. Arithmetic, forgive me. So as long as you can do basic arithmetic, you're fine in target test, uh, test prep. And it's also beginning to test the verbal component, uh, which a lot of programs don't have or kind of have beta components. Um, it's very interactive and I really liked it and I highly, highly recommend it. If you go through MLT, you can get a one year subscription for I believe it's $300 through a target test prep. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think that pretty much concludes our event for today. We have about five minutes left if um, any of the panelists are free to stay and if any of the um, audience members wanted to ask questions verbally 
you can go ahead and do so. Otherwise, you're definitely free to go. But we really want to thank everyone for coming and especially big thanks to our panelists for taking the time and giving us advice. We more than appreciate it and we'll definitely carry this into our careers. So yeah, you're free to go if you don't have anything else to ask. I just wanted to say thank you for your time. It was really informative and um, thank you for coming to the panel. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Diana. Hi, sorry. Um, no, yeah, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it, definitely as a student who's considering, who's on the edge of whether an MBA is the right path or not. I This is very insightful to learn about. And, I was wondering if we, I, if I had any more questions, if I could reach out to you guys um, via email, LinkedIn, or yeah. So um, I, I left my chat. email on the on on, my, on the chat, and please feel free to reach out. Okay, thank you so much, Douglas. Same here. Yeah, same. I'm happy to answer questions and uh, and be a resource. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, I want to thank the panel for coming. I really appreciate uh, you all talking and I learned a lot of stuff. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. I'm thinking of applying to deferred programs, so this is really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, and, and you can always apply the third, and if you get in, cool. You don't have to worry about it. And if you don't, then you can always apply again. I don't think it counts against you if you reapply. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, that was something I was worried about, and I wasn't sure if I'm completely ready to commit to it yet as like a senior, but that's good to know. <laughs> Thanks. And just know that when you're applying to the deferral programs, you will not be judged against like people like us you'll be judged against people that are applying also deferred. So it's a different set of standards. Do you know if it's generally more competitive in the deferred process or is it about the same? I think it's about the same, but like compared to your peers. Got it. Um, Got it. The okay. only thing I would say sorry, that I know is that I have to go now, but undergrad GPA matters more and work experience matters a little less. That's probably like the only difference. All right, yeah, thank you all so much. Okay. Thank you guys again. All right. <laughs> yeah. I just hopped off real quick. <laughs> <Damn>. Thanks. <laughs> Hosting again. Okay. Did you want me to reach out to Jordan about more information on the scholarship then? I can. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll also make sure the recording's good. Uh, oh, yeah. Let me stop that right yeah. now. That was the most awkward, like, <laughs> exit. <laughs> I know that was very weird. I thought they were going to say like bye or something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>